is private ritual possible? This is, uh, this is a kind of oxymoron, a private ritual. Because ritual uh, is or should be uh, precisely something that's collective uh, and shared, um, uh, is it possible for uh, the individual to uh, uh, produce uh, some kind of uh, shared patterning of experience such as ritual represents. Um, for Freud, uh, who is, uh, of course, a thinker in the uh, background of um, the wasteland and, and all the poetry that we're reading and uh, thinking about this uh, semester, uh, private ritual meant neurosis. Uh, sickness <laughs> of, of a kind, um, some kind of uh, uh, derangement. Uh, and indeed, uh, The Wasteland, which is a, a poem that in certain ways tries to imagine forms of private, a form of private ritual, or at least struggles with this question, uh, was certainly considered uh, by some readers to be a neurotic poem. Um, I, I began by last time by talking about that first uh, verse paragraph uh, of the, the poem. Why don't we go back there? Uh, that's um, on 474 uh, in your anthology. Uh, <coughs> I'll try to talk about the poem uh, in, in sequence uh, from uh, first section to, to last. Uh, and, and at least tell you some of the ways in which I make sense of it, uh, and, and this may be, I hope, helpful to you. Uh, in in the, this first section, The Burial of the Dead, um, we have, um, well, what I think of as, as a series of preliminary statements uh, about the poem's aims, uh, what it seeks, uh, what it would gesture towards or move towards. Uh, they include, well, some form of ecstasy. Uh, I think Marie's sled ride uh, is, is an experience of personal uh, freedom uh, in its modest way. Um, uh, in the mountains, there you feel free, uh, she says, uh, uh, re recalling um, that experience. Uh, Prophecy. Uh, the poem uh, introduces us to prophecy in the uh, second verse paragraph. Uh, freedom, I suppose. Uh, intimacy uh, between people. Uh, some kind of uh, meaningful coherence. Uh, all of these uh, possibilities uh, of experience are, uh, as it were, glimpsed in the poem in this, in this beginning. Uh, glimpsed uh, and then withdrawn or blocked or parodied. Um, Marie's sled, uh, well, isn't that a, a, a kind of uh, figure for uh, letting go um, and, um, well, uh, for release uh, and, and, and for trust? Uh, uh, an experience, as I say, of, of freedom. Um, Ultimately, uh, in what the thunder said, the poem will again return to those specific themes uh, when um, um, uh, it interprets uh, those um, uh, Sanskrit words, data, dayadvam, uh, and so on. Well, uh, in the second paragraph of the poem, the sort of second strophe, if you, if you like, um, we uh, were introduced to this sort of wasteland landscape. Uh, it is, uh, it's a kind of landscape that the poem re returns to at different points. Uh, what are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? Son of man, you cannot say or guess, for you know only a heap of broken images where the sun beats. And the dead tree gives no shelter, the cricket no relief, and the dry stone no sound of water. <coughs> uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, here, um, 
Well, we, we have a kind of symbolic representation, a kind of uh, uh, modernist iconography, if you like, of a spiritual state, uh, one of desiccation. It, it's, it is, as it were, a kind of picture of the mental space inhabited by the people that we'll meet in this poem. Um, it's, well, there, there, there's uh, quotations here as your uh, notes from Eliot and then your editor uh, explain from Ezekiel. Uh, the poem is drawing on uh, prophetic language and giving its own form of prophecy. Uh, but Ezekiel here is, is secularized in this uh, uh, context, and uh, you might look at this uh, as something more like a quotation from prophecy rather than prophecy itself. Uh, here, the poem's general concern with, with, with uh, a spiritual state that let me call the withdrawal of God, is represented as, as I say, as dryness. As dryness and as fragmentation. Uh, what we have is stony rubbish, a heap of broken images where the sun beats. Uh, here, you know, uh, we, we've got a kind of fragment of, of sacred text itself, a, you know, if you like, a bit of rubbish uh, uh, that has that, that's part of the poem's heap of broken images uh, that we will explore. Uh, the withdrawal of God uh, in the poem um, is, is a kind of fall into fragmentation uh, where experience uh, doesn't cohere, uh, where uh, there's dryness, uh, there's no connectivity, there's no uh, fluidity. Um, the uh, poem then moves abruptly, uh, and, and the poem you know, moves at this kind of exhilarating uh, abruptness uh, throughout uh, between kinds of language. Uh, here, uh, introducing Wagner, <coughs> and uh, a little quotation from uh, a, a quatrain uh, from the uh, libretto uh, for Tristan und Isolde, uh, <coughs> translated for us, uh, uh, fresh blows the wind to the homeland, my Irish darling, where are you waiting? Um, uh, Isolde uh, hears this, this song, and it's a, it's a kind of, uh, uh, well, song of um, uh, longing uh, as she uh, goes off to marry the wrong man. Um, uh, this Wagner text uh, and, and the little quotation from it uh, down below, uh, again, another quotation from uh, Wagner, Oden uh, leer das Meer, um, is uh, a, a, a more sinister and, and haunting uh, phrase, uh, maybe uh, translated as uh, waste and, and empty the sea, or desolate and empty the sea here. Um, this frames a little vignette, or a little, little scene, uh, a dialogue, or part of a dialogue. <coughs> uh, you gave me hyacinths first a year ago. They called me the hyacinth girl. And then out of that quotation, the, the poem uh, uh, now speaks to us, as it were, more directly, um, without quotation marks. Yet when we came back, late from the hyacinth garden, your arms full and your hair wet, I could not speak, and my eyes failed. I was neither living nor dead, and I knew nothing, looking into the heart of light, the silence. A kind of ecstatic uh, vision, uh, but here one of a certain uh, perhaps frightening emptiness, uh, where um, uh, a uh, uh, couple, presumably, um, have um, um, had some kind of uh, exchange uh, that leaves the speaker uh, with this particular uh, vision of uh, the heart of light and 
silence. The um, uh, references to uh, the flower, the hyacinth, uh, call up the um, uh, whole system of images of April and spring that the poem uh, will play on, uh, as well as the uh, uh, story of Hyacinth uh, from um, the Metamorphosis. Uh, and uh, your, your editor here will explain that Apollo loved and accidentally killed Hyacinth. Uh, from his blood sprang the flower named for him inscribed with I, a cry of grief. Um, here, uh, love uh, is associated with killing uh, and with um, uh, also with, with a kind of um, uh, generation, uh, uh, though of a um, painful uh, and um, uh, disturbing kind. Uh, here, <coughs> the, the, the general, you know, wasteland space, what, what I'm calling the kind of space of God's absence, uh, becomes a space between two people, two lovers, um, and uh, a, it seems, some form of missed connection. Uh, as a sequence, uh, these lines I've just been talking about, like the poem uh, as a whole, uh, advanced by collage. Uh, they, they make a kind of argument, they make a kind of sense, but perhaps not in the ways that we're used to. Um, these materials together, uh, I think, suggest that the loss of common experience that comes with uh, the withdrawal of God is, is played out between people in their erotic relationships. Uh, where God was, uh, sex is. <coughs> Uh, or uh, you could say that the loss of, of collective and shareable meanings which uh, results uh, in the privacy of our mental experience, our dreams, our aspirations, memories, poems, difficult poems, uh, is represented here in this poem by the irreducibly private and therefore anguishing nature of sexuality. And this is uh, uh, a theme that the poem will return to again uh, and again. Uh, instead of uh, reciprocity uh, and some kind of mutuality in human relations, we find um, uh, people doing kinds of violence to each other, uh, dominating each other, uh, finding uh, incompleteness uh, in their unions. The poem then moves on. Uh, to, again, with a kind of exhilarating shift of register or reference to a comic figure, Madame Sesostris, a uh, famous clairvoyant uh, with a bad cold. Uh, <coughs> I, I think of Madame Sesostris often in the winter. Um, she um, is nevertheless known to be the wisest woman uh, in Europe, and she has a wicked pack of cards. Um, what does she produce? Well. Uh, here, said she, is your card, the drowned Phoenician sailor. Who is you? Perhaps ourselves, the reader, uh, perhaps the poet. <coughs> uh, those are pearls that were his eyes. Look, here is Belladonna, the lady of the rocks, the lady of situations. Here is the man with three staves, uh, and here the wheel, and so on, uh, and something uh, a that she is forbidden to see. I do not find the hanged man fear death by water. I see crowds of people walking round in a ring. Thank you. If you see dear Mrs. Equitone, tell her I bring the horoscope myself. One must be so careful these days. Uh, this, this is a wonderful passage. Uh, here, it, it's doing a, a number of different things. Uh, the horoscope seems like a kind of uh, debased modern form uh, of uh, uh, modern system of interpretation, uh, way of understanding uh, the self. Uh, there is in these lines a kind of parody of occultism, which would include perhaps a parody of Yeats, uh, although uh, Yeats's A Vision wasn't published yet. 
Uh, at the same time, even while the poem is parodic, uh, it's serious too, uh, because in this kind of ad hoc, uh, somewhat fanciful and crazy way, the po uh, Madame Sosostris's cards is producing images that uh, uh, Eliot is dealing us uh, and that he will collect in the course of the poem and try to make some sense of uh, in the uh, collage that is uh, the, uh, the wasteland, uh, including uh, among those cards the drowned Phoenician sailor uh, who will uh, return for us in that little section, Death by Water. Uh, the, uh, uh, well, I, I like to think of Eliot himself uh, as Mrs. Equitone, uh, that is uh, because he's so difficult to read in his tone. Uh, and uh, uh, after all, um, it's uh, in a sense uh, Mrs. Equitone who's, who's, who's getting this stuff and is going to try to do something with it. Well, um, <coughs> part one, uh, The Burial of the Dead, ends uh, with another uh, instance of scene setting. Uh, now this, this sort of um, uh, symbolic iconography of the dry landscape is going to be overlaid on another landscape, which is metropolitan London, unreal city. This is Eliot's uh, evocative name for the urban space that the poem uh, represents. Unreal city under the brown fog of a winter dawn. A crowd flowed over London Bridge. So many. I had not thought death had undone so many. Sighs, short and infrequent, were exhaled. And each man fixed his eyes before his feet, flowed up the hill and down, in a rhyming couplet, King William Street to where St. Mary Woolnoth kept the hours with a dead sound on the final stroke of nine. You go to the note, and, and Eliot says, a phenomenon which I have often noticed, uh, just in case you were wondering whether he's in the scene or not. <coughs> uh, well, here um, we are uh, being introduced uh, to uh, the metropolis, uh, which, as I say, is uh, uh, the uh, uh, the scene of the wasteland. Um, it's, the, uh, it's where the events of the poem will take place, more or less. Uh, what, um, uh, what, what we're seeing here uh, are people going to work, um, people that we're going to see later, in effect, in the poem. Uh, uh, the typist and the young man carbuncular must be crossing the bridge two, uh, or the people that we'll meet in the pub, uh, and so on. Um, there's um, <coughs> a kind of strange mixing here of the dead and the living, of the apocalyptic and the utterly ordinary. Uh, Eliot then uh, moves with, you know, again, uh, uh, no framing uh, uh, that would help us to say, there, I saw one I knew, and then who, of course, is this I who's speaking to us? We don't really know. Um, I saw one I knew and stopped him, crying, Stetson, you who are with me in the ships at my lie, that corpse you planted last year in your garden, has it begun to sprout? Will it bloom this year? A hyacinth, perhaps? <clears throat> uh, or has the sudden frost disturbed its bed? Oh, keep the dog far hence that's friend to men, or with his nails he'll dig it up again. You, hypocrite lecteur, mon semblable, mon frère, he says, quoting uh, Baudelaire uh, at the very end, uh, uh, bursting out with it. Uh, it's it's a, uh, again, fascinating turn that the poem takes. Um, there is perhaps a kind of uh, glimpse of the still echoing world war in the here imagined hailing of um, one man uh, who knew another in battle, um, uh, that is, uh, uh, the ships at, at, at uh, uh, My Lai, that the, um, 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 uh, where they last met. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, 
there's um, here another instance of exchange between uh, two uh, people. Uh, here, um, there's, there's a way in which that first person's address to Stetson um, uh, plays upon parodies, uh, if you like, the poet's relation to you or to me, uh, the reader. Um, there's uh, here uh, a general uh, problem or question of how to make each other out, um, how to um, recognize and uh, uh, acknowledge um, the relation between brothers or semblables, um, uh, as, as uh, uh, Baudelaire uh, would have us um, call them. Um, the little glimpse of war and the war dead, perhaps, that uh, we get uh, in these lines will, um, throughout the rest of the poem, um, turn into a, a post-war uh, vision of, um, again, war between the sexes and war between people, um, most immediately in a game of chess, uh, the second section which is built around two conversations. Uh, the first takes place in uh, a well-to-do drawing room, the second uh, in uh, a pub. Um, there's uh, much to uh, contemplate in the opening uh, description of that um, uh, home uh, where the, uh, uh, we'll, we'll hear these, these two characters speaking and, and thinking uh, in a moment. Uh, one that is important <coughs> and recurs uh, often uh, in the scene, uh, one, one detail that recurs often in the poem uh, is the uh, image of uh, Philomel uh, around line 98. As though a window, oh excuse me, let me go a little bit further, above the antique mantle was displayed a picture, as though a window gave upon the sylvan scene the change of Philomel, another Ovidian metamorphosis, by the barbarous king so rudely forced uh, Philomel, uh, raped by uh, uh, Tereus, <coughs> is um, uh, transformed into the nightingale. Um, yet there the nightingale filled all the desert with inviolable voice, suddenly where Eliot has, has brought us into this dining room to see this picture, and now we're in the picture uh, listening to uh, the nightingale filling all the desert, this wasteland space, with a kind of, uh, again, song of complaint, a uh, kind of lyric voice um, that's called here, inviolable. And still she cried, and still the world pursues jug jug to dirty ears, uh, jug jug being the conventional representation of the nightingale song in uh, Elizabethan poetry. Well, um, there are, uh, th this is, uh, you know, again, uh, an image of um, sexual violence that produces a particular kind of uh, lyric utterance. Um, it is uh, a kind of um, motif that recurs in the poem. It's also a way of uh, imaging the poem itself as a kind of uh, uh, inviolable voice that emerges uh, from um, some kind of um, um, vision of erotic um, violation. Uh, the conversation that follows, if it's a conversation, uh, we really only have, what we, what, we, what we have is one speaker speaking in quotation marks and the other speaking without quotation marks. Um, what does that mean? Uh, presumably, the one speaker that we uh, overhear that seems to be female, uh, we're hearing her speak. Uh, when, we, when those quotation marks disappear, probably for the man's speech, um, that would seem to represent some kind of interiorized speech, uh, some kind of thought. Uh, my nerves are bad tonight. Yes, bad. Stay with me. Speak to me. Why do you never speak? Speak. What are you thinking of? What thinking? What? I never know what you are thinking. Think. 
I think we are in Rat's Alley, where the dead men lost their bones. What is that noise? The wind under the door. What is that noise now? What is the noise doing? Excuse me, what is the wind doing? Nothing. Again, nothing. Another phrase that will recur in the poem. Do you know nothing? Do you see nothing? Do you remember nothing? I remember those are pearls that were his eyes. Are you alive or not? Is there nothing in your head? But, oh, that Shakespearean rag. It's so elegant, so intelligent. What shall I do now? What shall I do? Quotations there from Prufrock, right? Uh, I shall rush out as I am and walk the street with my hair down. So here, <laughs> Prufrock's questions are being answered, perhaps. What shall we do tomorrow? What shall we ever do? The hot water at 10, and if it rains, a closed car at 4. And we shall play a game of chess, pressing littlest eyes and waiting for a knock upon the door. Uh, this is uh, <coughs> often understood as a version of an evening at the Elliot's. Uh, <laughs> the uh, female speaker uh, uh, is being satirized. Uh, surely she's uh, frightening, uh, but surely also her companion. Uh, they're driving each other mad. Uh, it's a kind of folie à deux. Uh, the uh, um, first person here speaks for a kind of state that other uh, people experience in the poem that other first persons in this poem uh, experience. That is the condition of having nothing in your head. Uh, nothing almost constituting something. Uh, again, nothing being a kind of wasteland. Uh, but in that wasteland, nevertheless, there persist certain kinds of rubbish, uh, fragments, uh, bits of language, as in Prufrock's consciousness. Uh, and this speaker uh, recalls, first of all, when pressed, those are pearls that were his eyes. A quotation from The Tempest. Um, a quotation from Ariel's song that um, holds out uh, some image of um, uh, death by water that would provide some kind of transformation um, where uh, eyes might become pearls. Um, this is a, uh, by calling up Shakespeare and the Tempest, uh, Eliot evokes Shakespeare's whole romance promise of uh, transformation uh, through drowning, um, through magic, <coughs> uh, and, and romance redemption. <coughs> uh, in the course of the poem, that little fragment will become another motif that recurs and circulates, uh, becoming almost a kind of object of collective memory uh, in the poem, uh, a bit of shared knowledge of, uh, let's say, uh, potential uh, that is drawn specifically from the literary past. You could say that here and elsewhere, uh, Shakespeare and literary tradition in general uh, stand in for sacred text uh, that would offer some kind of uh, guide to action and some source of meaning. Uh, here, uh, the uh, uh, sacred text of Shakespeare is um, no sooner uh, invoked than it is parodied uh, through uh, this um, uh, 1912 uh, jazz song that comes to mind, as also in presumably the speaker's head, the Shakespearean rag. Uh, it's so elegant, it's so intelligent. Uh, there's a way in which, uh, well, um, uh, Eliot's making fun of uh, his own uh, uh, wish for Shakespeare to be meaningful. Uh, there's also a way in which uh, the jazz brings this speaker suddenly to some kind of manic life. Uh, and, and he has a kind of energy uh, uh, fitfully uh, for a moment. Uh, and uh, here, as in other moments in the poem, um, 
high culture and low culture are brought together in, in a kind of vertiginous and, and interesting way. In fact, you could see this whole section, the game of chess, is doing that. Since uh, we move from the drawing room and its um, uh, particular uh, interior decoration to the pub scene that follows uh, with uh, uh, <coughs> the uh, account of um, uh, Lil's childbearing uh, and, and uh, so forth, uh, that we uh, then get to over here. Uh, and then the poem, uh, or rather this section of the poem, ends with another quotation from Shakespeare, um, Ophelia's uh, parting words in uh, Hamlet, uh, good night, sweet ladies, uh, and, and so forth. Um, the, uh, uh, the game of chess here, uh, well, it has uh, all sorts of complex uh, resonances. Um, Eliot's certainly uh, punning on some sense of stale mating uh, and, and unions, uh, sexual unions that have gone wrong um, and that have left people um, against each other um, uh, in warring postures. Uh, as the poem proceeds in the fire sermon, uh, we get more, more scenes of uh, erotic uh, impasse um, uh, or, uh, or worse, uh, uh, erotic um, uh, violence of, of different kinds. Um, the scene of uh, the, the Thames, the water that flows through London, uh, is now uh, brought into focus again, not at London Bridge uh, precisely, but uh, just the uh, uh, shore uh, where, um, well, Eliot describes it as, the river's tent is broken, the last fingers of leaf clutch and sink into the wet bank, the wind crosses the brown land unheard, the nymphs are departed. Sweet Thames runs softly till I end my song, the river bears no empty bottles, sandwich pap uh, papers, silk handkerchiefs, cardboard boxes, cigarette ends, or other testimony of summer nights, as it usually does. Uh, the nymphs are departed, and their friends, the loitering heirs of city directors, departed, having left no addresses. Um, here, uh, Eliot's, you know, conjuring uh, kind of erotic uh, debris um, that has been left behind by um, these uh, businessmen and their uh, nymphs. As the uh, uh, poem uh, progresses, uh, well, uh, there are more uh, images of um, uh, erotic um, confusion and, and uh, uh, desolation. Uh, but at the back, <coughs> excuse me, but at my back from time to time I hear on the bottom of 479 the sound of horns and motors which shall bring Sweeney to Mrs. Porter in the spring. Oh, the moon, sh I should be able to sing this for you. Oh, the moon shone bright on Mrs. Porter and on her daughter. They washed their feet in soda water. Et oh, ces voix d'enfants chantant dans la coupole. Twit, twit, twit. Jug, 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 so rudely forced, terru. Uh, again, a, a kind of amazing uh, linguistic um, um, uh, vertigo as we pass from uh, a body uh, Australian soldier ballad about Mrs. Porter, uh, which has all kinds of uh, obscene stanzas that your editor doesn't uh, quote for you, uh, to uh, Verlaine's uh, Im uh, image uh, of uh, children's voices uh, singing under the dome uh, in his Parsifal, uh, introducing another narrative and theme that, that recurs throughout the poem, the Grail story. Um, and uh, uh, the story of uh, Parsifal. Uh, <coughs> uh, the uh, poem moves then uh, with those, those uh, first of all, just those sounds, uh, which are the, uh, uh, the sounds of um, Philomel. Um, 
here, you know, human voice re reduced to a kind of noise almost, um, to um, another anecdote, uh, Mr. Eugenides, the uh, Smyrna merchant, uh, unshaven, who uh, asks the me of the poem in demotic French uh, to uh, 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 luncheon at the Cannon Street Hotel, followed by a weekend at the Metropole, uh, a proposition, uh, it seems, uh, and again, a kind of um, uh, uh, sinister sexual invitation. Uh, there then follows the uh, extended scene uh, between the typist and young man carbuncular. Uh, it, um, uh, a, a uh, uh, ugly um, scene of um, uh, sexual emptiness uh, and, and um, uh, domination. Uh, and, and Eliot uh, doesn't shrink from, uh, um, you know, representing uh, this, this man in, in uh, you know, the, the most uh, uh, ugly uh, and um, uh, both visually and, and morally, the most ugly terms, uh, although uh, the poem was indeed uh, a lot uglier uh, yet than it is now. Uh, at the very end of it, uh, after he's uh, left uh, and, and uh, bestowed one final patronizing kiss, um, uh, the uh, poem used to, end, or this section of the poem used to end with a rhyme uh, that he, you know, then stopped outside to take a piss. Uh, that was excised, however, uh, in the uh, um, uh, course of the uh, poem and is an unnecessary um, uh, further um, uh, uh, registering of the degradation of the scene. Uh, then the poem uh, moves to um, well, uh, th these inset lyric uh, songs on 482, the river sweats, again we're on the river, uh, and we're given a kind of image of uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, I and uh, the Earl of Leicester, um, a potential lover <coughs> for the Virgin Queen, uh, who are, are um, uh, being carried downstream. Um, and then, uh, Finally, uh, another speaker uh, emerges, um, this time uh, it seems uh, a woman uh, speaking again in quotation marks, trams and dusty trees, Highbury bore me, Richmond and Kew undid me. By Richmond I raised my knees, supine on the floor of a narrow canoe. My feet are at Moorgate and my heart under my feet. After the event, he wept. He promised a new start. I made no comment. What should I resent? On Margate Sands, I can connect nothing with nothing. The broken fingernails of dirty hands, my people, humble people who expect nothing. This, there, there's a kind of extraordinary, um, metamorphosis uh, of speaker here, uh, where uh, we, uh, we, we begin listening to the uh, sexual anecdotes of uh, presumably one of these nymphs abandoned by one of the city directors uh, who uh, um, has been had uh, in uh, the park <coughs> uh, in Highbury, Richmond, and Kew. Uh, uh, there's been, um, it seems, an event, perhaps what? Uh, a pregnancy, an abortion. Um, uh, he wept. <coughs> he promised a new start. Uh, what should I resent? Um, that um, uh, experience then uh, shifts to uh, another uh, location. There's a kind of mutation of the speaker going on uh, on Margate Sands. It's just that location. And then uh, I can connect nothing with nothing. And now um, the, uh, uh, that phrase, nothing, uh, nothing with nothing, uh, what's in your head, nothing, um, that, um, those lines and, and that motif recur. Um, that first person is like the first person of a game of chess, as if that woman had 
turned into that man. And uh, Margaret Sands uh, locate the poem at this moment at um, one of the uh, uh, places where, uh, after uh, working in the city and uh, succumbing to a kind of nervous breakdown, Eliot went to compose uh, parts of the wasteland. Uh, so there's a way in which he, too, the poet, is that first person there, merged with uh, these other first persons who finally then merge with Queen Elizabeth uh, when uh, we hear that first person say, my people, humble people who expect nothing. Uh, <clears throat> Again, uh, a, there's a kind of uh, shifting and metamorphosis uh, of identity uh, as people are brought into relationship um, with uh, each other through their shared uh, experience of erotic failure. Um, let's see. Um, not too many minutes left to talk about the end of the poem and to give some sense of its shape. Um, here, here's, a, here's a kind of uh, narrative of the poem. The Burial of the Dead. The title, it comes from the Anglican Book of Common Prayer. Uh, it suggests that the poem will uh, search for perhaps itself try to substitute for uh, the um, uh, kind of um, uh, ritual um, understanding of life and death uh, that uh, the Anglican Book of Common Prayer provides. Uh, again, some kind of collective meaning. Uh, a game of chess then uh, specifies the poem's problem. Uh, as erotic impasse, as a kind of stalemating, as uh, the failure of love. Uh, the fire sermon then proposes a kind of solution. Uh, from the Buddha's teaching, self-control is a way to combat lust and domination, the selfishness of desire, uh, <coughs> all of which resonates uh, in, in a moral register uh, with, the, with the poetic program of tradition and the individual talent where the theme is self-extinction uh, or, or um, uh, self-submission. Uh, the point uh, in the middle of the poem where I've been uh, dwelling for the past few minutes, the point is to convert the fires of lust uh, into refining and spiritualizing fires. Then there's a kind of scherzo, that little section, Death by Water, uh, where um, the drowned Phoenician sailor seems to, uh, well, be a kind of sacrificial figure to represent, uh, again, iconog iconographically uh, self-extinction. And then finally, uh, after this emblematic sacrifice, uh, we are uh, introduced to the long final section, What the Thunder Said, when there is a return of divine speech and the promise of rain and of water, what the poem uh, seems to be looking for, uh, aligning um, um, the redemptive uh, regeneration that would come with the rain, with the um, uh, uh, with the experience of divine speech uh, made present uh, here in that simple syllable, da. Well, um, let me um, uh, let me say uh, just a couple things uh, about uh, the shape of the poem as we have it. I've asked you to look at. Um, um, Pound's uh, work on the poem in the form of uh, uh, the, uh, uh, some pages from the Wasteland Manuscripts. Well, uh, Pound uh, collaborated uh, in the writing of this poem by, um, in particular, uh, excising uh, and uh, shortening the poem uh, at many points, and specifically um, uh, if, if you study the uh, uh, drafts, 
uh, by, um, I think, um, isolating those moments uh, in the poem uh, where Eliot is drawn to a kind of uh, romantic lyricism on, the, on uh, what becomes the first page of the poem, uh, April is the cruelest month, um, Pound circles the word forgetful with forgetful snow. Uh, in the uh, uh, passage about uh, Philomel, he's, he circles the word inviolable for inviolable voice. Um, uh, Pound wants to get the romanticism and lyricism of the poem out of it in certain ways. Um, Eliot uh, resists that. And there are uh, ways in which these two men um, working together and against each other uh, to create the poem uh, enact some of the poem's own struggle with lyricism uh, and with romanticism uh, and uh, help us to see that struggle as, as part of what uh, goes into the creation of the poem uh, itself. Um, one of the sections that, proof, uh, <laughs> that Pound had the biggest effect on uh, was uh, Death by Water, which was uh, originally a, a long heroic uh, narrative uh, or mock heroic narrative uh, ending um, uh, in um, the uh, sailors drowning. Um, that short section uh, is, is worth dwelling on uh, for a moment um, because uh, it is uh, an instance where um, we are, uh, well, given, I think, um, an image of what uh, Eliot was giving up. Uh, he is giving up um, a certain investment in romance quest uh, and more, lar more generally romanticism uh, that's emblematized by this drowned figure. Um, there's also a way in which this very short section uh, points us to and makes us think about the shortness of the poem as a whole. Uh, the Wasteland is the shortest long poem in the language. Uh, it is uh, you know, a kind of radically condensed epic. Um, and um, <coughs> there's, there's a kind of, you could say, um, claim made by the poem's form that epic extension and duration are no longer possible, just as romance quest is no longer possible, precisely because we lack the kind of culturally shared vocabulary and language that would uh, allow Eliot to create a kind of continuous form. Instead, what we have is a radically condensed uh, and discontinuous form. Uh, the brokenness of the poem's form representing the brokenness of a world that doesn't have a sacred center. Uh, <coughs> finally, um, there's the matter of those notes. Uh, they are, uh, I think, an important part of the poem. They get, kind of get lost in the editor's notes um, uh, in your anthology. Well, when Eliot first published the poem, uh, it didn't have those notes. When he, uh, when he published it in England in the Dial magazine, when he published it, um, excuse me, in the Criterion, when he published it uh, in America um, shortly after, um, uh, uh, he added those notes uh, to uh, extend the length of uh, the poem. Uh, he was asked to make a longer uh, poem. Uh, there's a way in which uh, those notes establish a particular kind of figure, uh, a poet who is also a scholar and an editor uh, who is um, uh, producing a poem that needs notes uh, and that uh, needs to explain itself in these ways and that uh, draws on literary tradition and, and uh, various forms of uh, cultural knowledge that require annotation. Um, Eliot presents himself as this figure, uh, a poet who's also a kind of scholar. And um, uh, this figure emerges uh, as a kind of central modern uh, figure, replacing the um, uh, epic poet of the past, the one who uh, produced uh, a poem such as Paradise Lost uh, without any footnotes. Well, 
Uh, Hart Crane uh, uh, responds to all of what I've been talking about today uh, and uses it as a point of orientation to create uh, a related but very different kind of poetry, as we'll see on Wednesday. <laughs>